with a newer, bigger SUV on the way that borrows this one's name, I'd like to take this opportunity to get ahead of the jokes by reminding you all that when it comes to the Highlander, there can only be one. Okay, not really. Toyota says it's going to keep building both, which begs the question, should you wait for that new Grand Highlander, or does this one have what it takes to shuttle your family around in comfort and style? I'd say it depends on just how big your family is, but if you're looking for comfort and style, look no further. For more expert car reviews, don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. Look, we're never gonna see eye to eye when it comes to styling, at least not all of us. But in my opinion, this fourth generation Highlander still looks good after a few years on the market. Although I will say, I prefer the rest of the lineup. It has that cool kind of chrome bar across the top of the grille. And it's not that this kind of sport-inspired XSE trim doesn't look good. I just like that one better. It's a little more sophisticated, a little more upscale. This thing is cool. It's just not my preference. Now, the fact that it's sport-inspired is also why it has this red upholstery in here, as well as this fake carbon fiber trim. But even if you go with black, the seats look cool because they have these stripes in the centers of the seat backs and the cushions in the first and second rows. My only issue, and this is not a Toyota one alone, the third row doesn't match. It's just plain black, and that includes with this red upholstery. And I know it's a small thing, but to me, it's the little things that do make vehicles feel extra special. So that is a miss for this Highlander. And another one, this being sport inspired, no paddle shifters. And I don't get that at all. And for any of you out there telling me, Dan, People that drive three-row SUVs don't use paddle shifters. Well, you're probably right, but that's not the point. And it's not about feeling sporty, in my opinion. It's about engine braking. Let's say you're on the highway and traffic's starting to slow down, but not enough that you want to cause that chain reaction behind you by tapping the brakes. Just downshift. It's very handy. I used to do it all the time when I drove a Subaru Outback that had paddle shifters. I do it in the vehicles I test with paddle shifters. It is a very handy an underutilized feature. And then when you add in the whole sport inspired theme of this XSE, well, I do think those would have been nice inside of this Highlander. Anyway, here is a sign of just how much the auto industry has changed in a few short years. This screen, eight inches, but it looks tiny. I honestly thought it was a six inch screen when I first got in here. And again, not just a Toyota problem, I just reviewed that Nissan Pathfinder. Rock Creek Edition also has an eight inch screen. Looks small in there. Mostly has to do with how big the cabin is. The dashboards in these things are massive. So these screens do look tiny, especially in an era where 12 and 14 inch screens are becoming the norm. And if you do want the 12.3 inch screen that's available in the Highlander, well, you have to go all the way up to the top of the lineup, and that means no sport-inspired goodies. Again, that's up to you. If you want to pay top dollar for a Highlander, just know you can't get it with stuff like the sport tune suspension, as well as the styling of this one I'm driving. Now, regardless of screen size, every 2023 Highlander has a new infotainment interface that Toyota has been rolling out in some of its other products, like the Sequoia and the Tundra, and it's really good. Now it does have cloud-based navigation, which is active in this tester that I'm driving. And I gotta say, pretty awesome. I've used it quite extensively by now, and I really do like it. It almost makes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with Google Maps redundant. Now, not completely because I am still a big fan, but it's not necessary to hook your phone up if you want to use a good, clean, and simple map interface. This one, is really sharp. Now, if you do hook your phone up, well, you can do it wirelessly and you can use Google Maps or Apple Maps if you are some sort of masochist. And you also get access to your messages, 
phone calls, all of that good stuff. I do have to say though, I have noticed some issues with the wireless Apple CarPlay connection these days, and it's not just in Toyota products. Volvo, doesn't matter. Everything I've tested lately with wireless Apple CarPlay had all kinds of voice recognition issues and connectivity problems. My phone is up to date. I've turned it off a few times to see if that would kind of reboot. Nothing. That is kind of annoying and something that has been a problem so far this week inside this Highlander as well. Now, other than that, everything in here is very straightforward. You've got plain and simple controls for just about everything, including the climate system. Big knobs for temperature, buttons, little toggles, a separate LCD screen right there so you can see exactly what's happening. The steering wheel controls are the same thing. It's like I always say, I do think it's important to open the owner's manual when you buy a vehicle, but the nice thing is you don't have to do it as soon as you drive off the dealer lot in this 2023 Highlander. It is very self-explanatory. There is no learning curve in here, and that is great to see, especially in such a family-friendly vehicle. Something else I really like, all the storage in here. You've got little cubbies everywhere up front. Not as good in the back, but something that's cool, with the second row captain's chairs, you have these two little cup holders in the middle, and that is very convenient. It's also convenient to get those chairs out of the way when you want to use the third row. Although that brings us back to what I mentioned off the top about the family size dilemma. Because if you've got more than a couple kids, you might want to wait for that Grand Highlander to come out or expand your search beyond the Toyota showroom because this third row is cramped. And it's not just about leg room either. These second row chairs, they are on rails. The bench itself back there is actually bolted almost directly to the floor, which means even the youngest passengers are going to find it cramped. Now, something else I don't like, there is no way to fold the second row seats from the cargo area. And even the third row, you have to reach in and pull these little handles, which means in the wintertime, you're probably gonna end up wearing whatever is on the back bumper, especially all this salt this time of year. Not great. Now, the cargo space itself, pretty average for the segment. There's 450 liters behind the third row, and that expands to 1,400 with them folded. And then it's 2,400 liters when you fold the second row as well, which isn't too bad. A couple more points though. Number one, there is no centralized close and lock button back here. And the other thing, this has to be one of the slowest power tailgates on the market today. Now, admittedly, those are fairly minor gripes, which is kind of a running theme with this thing. And it probably explains why this has become one of the segment's best sellers. Now, the biggest change this time around, no more V6 engine. Yes, you can still get that fuel sipping hybrid, but you can't get the three and a half liter V6. Instead, there is a turbocharged 2.4 liter four cylinder. And I know a lot of folks out there aren't fully sold on these downsized engines in such big vehicles. But I gotta say, this thing has plenty of pep. Now it's got 310 horsepower this year, which is up from the 263 that the V6 made. And that matters way more than the fact that this has less horsepower than the last engine. Because all that torque, well, that's what gets you up and going. And even in eco mode, this thing will boogie. It's surprising. This isn't exactly a lightweight vehicle. It weighs something like 1,900 kilograms, but this four-cylinder is perfectly fine. Now, the Highlander is rated to pull 5,000 pounds with the gas-only powertrain. That was true with the V6, and apparently it's still true with this four-cylinder. That's something that I'm not fully sold on. And the same thing applies with V6s. If you tow with a V6 versus a V8, well, the V6 is gonna have to work harder and the same theory applies here. I can only imagine what the fuel bill is going to look like if you have a trailer hooked up to the back of the Highlander with this turbocharged four-cylinder. But then again, it can pull more than the 3,500 pounds that the hybrid is rated to tow. So that is something in this thing's favor. And it's kind of a best of both worlds situation because this thing, surprisingly efficient. Now, no, it's not as good as the hybrid. And on paper, 
It's only about a half a liter better combined than the V6. It's rated to consume 9.9 .9 liters per 100 kilometers. But something tells me that Toyota was pretty conservative with that number because all week long, I have been doing much better than that. Now, it is very cold today, which has seen that fuel consumption rate climb just a bit, but I'm still below 9.9. .9. And earlier this week, on an admittedly highway heavy drive, I was burning 9.1 liters per 100 kilometers. That's about what you'd expect with a much smaller SUV. And now consider this thing has all wheel drive. It's big, heavy, and has room for seven or eight passengers, assuming at least a few of them are kids. Now, a couple more notes about the drive, and some of them aren't exactly positive. There's virtually no brake feel. The pressure, you can't even feel it. It's really bad. It's unnerving when you're trying to slow down in a hurry. Let's say you're coming up on a yellow light you can't actually feel what's happening under your foot. And that is troubling, especially in an SUV this size and weight. Doesn't feel like you're gonna make it sometimes, even though you are. So you end up putting even more pressure and then it's really lurchy and awkward. There's also a little too much body roll in something that's supposed to have sport tuned suspension. It just feels really top heavy on some of these winding country roads. No, I don't expect you to be pushing your Highlander hard, even this XSE one but it does stand out. It is comfortable though. I do have to say, in spite of the short rebound rates, does pretty well to absorb most road imperfections. Yeah, potholes and pressure cracks, you might feel them just a little bit more, but that almost has as much to do with these 20 inch wheels and the low profile tires that they're wrapped in than it has to do with the suspension itself. Those and the steering, no real feel there, but that's not all that surprising. The good news is there's not a massive dead spot on center like you might get in something like the Subaru Ascent. So that is in the Highlander's favor. Now, in terms of amenities, this thing has a decent amount starting with advanced safety features. The XS e trim has just about everything Toyota has to offer. The only feature that's missing is reverse automatic braking. So it's not gonna stop itself if you're backing out of your driveway and there's traffic, but it does have blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic alert. So it will let you know if there are cars coming. And then it's also got stuff like lane departure warning and keeping assistance, as well as forward collision warning with pedestrian and cyclist detection. And yes, automatic emergency braking and adaptive cruise control. When it comes to creature comforts, not a ton, at least nothing beyond expectations. So I've got a heated steering wheel and heated front seats touchscreen infotainment, those wireless phone connections I talked about, Wi-Fi hotspot navigation that is subscription-based, so is the satellite radio, but there's nothing that really stands out. So there's no ventilated seats up front, no heated seats in the back. That's really the only stuff that it's missing that I would like to see for the 52 and a half grand or so this thing starts at before tax. And then as far as the rest of the lineup goes, well, it starts at about 47 and a half grand and it ranges up to 57 and a half grand. And then the hybrid powertrain adds a few grand to each. But one thing to note, you can't get the hybrid powertrain with this XSE trim, which is something to keep in mind if you want a sport inspired Highlander. To recap, I like how torquey and efficient this new turbo engine is and the cool interior styling in this Highlander XSE. I don't like the bizarre braking, how much body roll there is, or that this trim's third row is so bland compared to the rest of the cabin. At the end of the day, only you are going to know if this not so grand Highlander makes sense for you and your family, or if you guys are going to need more space. But I could see it working for a family of four with only the occasional need for an extra set of seats. If that doesn't sound like you, then the Grand Highlander will be here soon. Not to mention there are already entries on the market with more spacious third rows. Otherwise, there's a good reason this thing has become one of the best sellers in this segment. And it starts with Toyota's well-earned reputation for both reliability and safety. But there's even good bang for your buck here too, which definitely helps to sweeten the deal. The new engine and infotainment, not exactly revolutionary. They just keep this thing chugging along as a solid pick in one of the most competitive segments out there.